It's great to be here at .NET Conf 2022. Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Roth. I'm a product manager on the ASP.NET team. And I'm thrilled to be here at .NET Conf to see all the great new features in .NET 7. In this session, we're going to look at all the new stuff in ASP.NET Core in .NET 7 for web developers. ASP.NET Core is our modern web framework for .NET. It's unified and provides everything you need to build beautiful web UI and powerful back-end services. Unlike other development platforms that require you to piece together a web app from different frameworks, ASP.NET Core gives you a complete and cohesive web development solution. If you're building web UI, you can use MVC and Razor Pages to dynamically generate UI from the server. You can integrate with popular JavaScript frameworks like Angular and React. Or you could build your entire rich interactive web UI in C Sharp using Blazor. For backend services, you can build standards based HTTP APIs. You can build real time services with SignalR and powerful backend services using gRPC. For all of your cross cutting concerns, ASP.NET Core provides a rich array of middleware that you can use for common needs like routing, security, localization, and much more. ASP.NET Core integrates with cloud ready .NET platform extensions that handle concerns like logging, configuration, and dependency injection. And then when you're ready to host your ASP.NET Core web application, it can run on a variety of servers, including Kestrel, our built-in, ultra-fast, cross-platform web server. So no matter what type of web app you're trying to build, ASP.NET Core has you covered so that you can stay focused on your app and stay productive. Now, ASP.NET Core delivers industry-leading performance. In the public Tech Empower benchmarks, ASP.NET Core maxes out the test hardware to deliver a whopping 7 million requests per second, which is 11 times faster than Node. With gRPC services, ASP.NET Core is faster than Java, Go, C++, and Rust. But it's not just about benchmark performance. ASP.NET Core delivers real-world performance for global scale applications. At Microsoft, we use .NET for many of our products and services. And as they've upgraded to use the latest .NET versions and ASP.NET Core, they have realized enormous performance gains and significant e efficiency improvements. For example, Microsoft Graph provides access to data and int intelligence for the Microsoft 365 ecosystem. They handle 70 billion requests per day. When they upgraded from .NET Framework to .NET 6, they were able to reduce overall CPU usage by 37% and also reduce operational costs by 91% for each 1 billion requests served. Azure Active Directory, their gateway API, handles 185 billion requests per day so that you can log in to all those cool services. When they upgraded to .NET 6, they reduced CPU usage by 67% and increased app efficiency, the ratio of throughput to CPU usage, by 50%. Microsoft Teams migrated 50 projects and 700 APIs, reducing CPU usage by 25%, improving P99 latency by 60%. And the list just goes on. Azure Cosmos DB, five times the throughput. Exchange Online, they reduced P99 latency by 80%. Azure App Service, they moved their front-end roles to uh, .NET 6, and they were able to increase throughput by 80%. But what's really cool is they were also able to replace Nginx in their Linux worker VMs with ASP.NET Core and Kestrel. And that allowed them to unblock new scenarios and features like HTTP2 support and gRPC. So by building on .NET and ASP.NET Core, you're on a sure foundation that's built to be efficient and ready to scale. Now, we just announced the release of .NET 7 which is loaded with great new features for ASP.NET Core uh, for web developers. ASP.NET Core in .NET 7 is built for speed. If you thought .NET 6 was fast, .NET 7 is even faster. In .NET 7, we also added support for the latest protocols, standards, and architectures so that you can be sure that you're always getting the best of the web. At the same time, we simplified web development uh, in .NET 7 so that you can get started fast and still take advantage of all the latest and greatest features. 
Uh, to help you stay productive, we've added even more middleware, like support for output caching, rate limiting, request decompression. We've added new features to SignalR and Blazor, like uh, SignalR client results and Blazor custom elements uh, that enable new scenarios and empower you as a developer. Let's take a look at each of these. All right, so ASP.NET Core in .NET 7 is faster than ever before. It delivers next level performance with .NET 7. Uh, thanks to optimizations across the .NET platform, ASP.NET Core now uh, performs on the Tech Empower benchmarks, has post significant performance gains. So 8% faster on plain, the plain text benchmark, 16% uh, faster with JSON handling, 25% faster with the end to end fortunes test. HP2 is way more optimized in .NET 7 than in .NET 6. For example, if you're doing gRPC server streaming, uh, .NET 7 is eight times faster than .NET 6, making it faster than Go. We also did work to make sure that you can take advantage of all the uh, processing power of machines with lots and lots of cores. Uh, ASP.NET Core in .NET 7 is five times faster on the massive 80 core ARM64 Ampere Ultra VMs that are available on, on Azure. So all these performance improvements, they mean lower operational costs for you and better experience, user experiences for your users. Now, we work hard to support the latest protocols and standards uh, with quality implementations that are tuned for performance and also hardened for security. In .NET 7, ASP.NET Core now supports HTTP3, the latest version of the HTTP protocol. This enables faster connections and also better multiplexing over a connection using the new UDP-based quick transport. We added support for WebSockets over HTTP2, so you get that familiar full duplex programming model over an HTTP2 connection. And we added experimental support for Web Transport, which is a new draft protocol for multiplexing streams and datagrams over a single HTTP3 connection. All of these new protocols are available cross-platform and uh, cross-architecture with uh, Kestrel, our built-in web server. Now, with ASP.NET Core, you can build apps big and also small. In .NET 6, we started work to make it easier to get started with ASP.NET Core, but also to push down popular features from frameworks like MVC to lower in the stack so they could be used by more place, in more places. Uh, this effort led to a simplified hosting model and also minimal APIs. Minimal APIs simplify web development, and they also uh, make various MVC features available in more parts of the stack, and they also deliver enhanced performance. In .NET 7, we've improved minimal APIs further to ensure that your APIs can be both simple and powerful. We added support for endpoint groups so that you can organize your minimal APIs together in a, in a group under a common URL prefix and also configure them collectively. You can now add endpoint filters that add cross-cutting concerns to your endpoints, like support for validation and logging. Uh, we made minimal APIs more explicit so that they're easier to test and also so that you get better open API spec generation. And finally, we simplified how you configure authentication for your APIs, uh, making it easier to build and secure your endpoints. All right. Let's go take a look at how easy it is to get started with ASP.NET Core in .NET 7 using minimal APIs. So we're going to hop over here. Get my mouse working. Let's go into Visual Studio. I have Visual Studio installed with .NET 7, and I've created just an empty ASP.NET Core project. It's really simple, and it's already running. It just has a single minimal API endpoint that returns the string, hello world, and we can see it running over here in the browser. And it's amazing. It's just four lines of code. Like This is the entire application. You know, minimal, uh, minimal code, um, uh, you know, less ceremony, minimal APIs. Now, what I want to do here is build a, a new API uh, for a classic to-do list, you know, uh, CRUD operations, get, post, put, delete, uh, to get a list of to-dos and, and uh, manipulate a list of to-dos. OK, so to do that, uh, let's add our to-do uh, type so that we're going to use with our API. I'm going to just add a little snippet here to save on typing. So here's my to-do class, and it's got an ID and a name, and it is complete Boolean property. And then we're going to use uh, Entity Framework Core for storing all of our to-dos. Let's give ourselves a little bit more room for code. 
All right, so and uh, that way we'll have a, a, a storage for all of our to do uh, to do items. Now I want to configure this to do DB, uh, database context so that it'll be available to my minimal APIs through dependency injection. So I'm going to do that up above. Let's configure it as a service. Uh, I've got a little snippet for that. Let's do add the to do uh, DB context as a service. There it is. And here we're going to use just an in-memory database for, for simplicity. OK, so we should be all set up to now add our first API. Let's do app.map get. This will be a, a get based API slash to do's. And this will take in our to do database. Uh, and then we'll, what should we do? We'll just return database to do's and then to list. Uh, async, so that will asynchronously get the list of to-dos, and that ought to do it. Okay, so let's rerun the application and see if our new to-dos endpoint is working. Okay, there's hello world. Obviously, that's still working. And now if we go to slash to-dos in the browser, we get this lovely empty JSON array. So it's working. We just don't have any to-dos yet, but it's doing JSON serialization and handling all that for us with just that one line of code. That's pretty great. OK, um, now we need a way to actually add to-dos to, to our API. We need like a, a post-based endpoint. Let's go ahead and add that next. We'll add a post to-dos minimal API. So map post, it'll be at the same uh, URI. And here we're going to actually take the to-do instance in the request body, and then we'll inject the to-do database context again. We'll add the to-do to the, the database, save it. And then below, we're returning not just a result, a typed result. This is a new feature in .NET 7. Let me zoom in here. So this API is actually returning uh, created of to do, a nice strongly typed object that represents the result of this API. It's new in .NET 7. That makes our API much more explicit, easier to test, and we get better open API spec generation. Now, we do still have this repetition of the, um, the URLs for the, these APIs. That's a little, seems a little unfortunate. Can we, can we consolidate those somehow? And the answer is yes. We can do that in .NET 7, thanks to the new support for endpoint groups. Let's add an endpoint group here called todos. To create one, we'll do app.map uh, group. And we'll call this one todos to match our URL prefix. We'll give it that uh, URL prefix. And now what we can do is just take this to-dos instance and replace app here and here, and then remove to-dos here and here, because these uh, minimal API URLs will now be relative to the, to the group. OK, let's make sure we didn't break anything. We'll go ahead and run the app again, just to make sure that our get request is still, still working. All right, there's hello world, and then slash to-dos. OK, great. So it's still working, uh, but we still don't have any uh, to-dos. We have a, a post endpoint now, but we need some way of sending requests to it. Uh, how, we, how do we want to do that? Well, an easy way to do that is to use uh, Swagger UI. Swagger UI is a, a simple you know, uh, web UI-based uh, test tool for, for APIs um, that's based on the open API specifications. It reads in the metadata about the API and gives you a nice testing user interface. We can add Swagger UI to our minimal APIs using the popular swashbuckle uh, .NET community project. I've actually already added the package to this, this project, so let's go ahead and wire it up. So first, we need to add the, uh, the necessary services. So let's add the services up here. So we got the, uh, we're going to add the API Explorer services. So we get metadata about our APIs, and then the Swagger generation related services, or Open API spec related generation services. We also need to actually wire up the endpoints. So let's add the Swagger and Swagger UI endpoints below here. So use Swagger, use Swagger UI. OK, and so now, well, one more thing. I want to change one little bit in my launch settings. I don't want to keep opening up Hello World. Uh, let's go and change the launch URL to Swagger. All right, great. So now it should open up the Swagger UI for me automatically. Let's run that and see what we get. Close a couple of these tabs. And there we go. OK, we got some. Uh, Swagger UI. It looks a little weird. There we go. So now we can see, uh, let me make that a little, zoom out a little bit. Oh my goodness. Let's zoom out a little bit so that uh, we can see the, the text. Okay, so now we can see our get endpoint and our post endpoint. We can try it out. Let's add a to do. Let's call this uh, try.net7. And let's go ahead and execute that. And if we look below, Hopefully, yes. OK, we got our, uh, what here? like this, our 201 created response with our new to do. So that looks good. So we're able to create to do's now. And if we go up above, we should be able to get the list of to do's from our API as well. And we can. So there's our. 
create a to-do. Great, so now we can create to-dos. We should probably add all of the other um, uh, uh, endpoints for doing like you know, po uh, put and delete and those things. I'll just quickly add a snippet to add all those. Um, there they all are. So we got put, we got map by get. Well, I don't think I'm missing a namespace. Let me, let me fix that up. Okay, we got get by ID, put, and delete is below. Now, one thing I want to call out here that's interesting. So this get by ID, it's also using type results, but it could return one of two different results. It could return a 200 OK, or it could return a 404 not found. And those are different types. How does that work? Well, new in .NET 7, we have this results type, which basically acts like a union type so that we can explicitly say, uh, in a strongly typed way that this API could return either of those two results. If we go ahead and run the app again and look at the uh, generated Swagger UI documentation for our get that takes an ID, sure enough, uh, we are seeing that it can take uh, return a 200 or a 404. So that looks beautiful, much more explicit uh, about our API, better documentation. Now, the last thing I want to do is I want to update uh, this API to also be secure, to, to use uh, have authentication and authorization. That's been a bit tricky to do in the past, but with .NET 7, it's way easier. We basically just have to add two lines of code. Uh, let me go up here into our services, and I'll add the auth-related services. So I'm doing add authentication and then add JOT bearer-based authentication. So you're, you're going to need a, a JOT token to, that you have to send with every request. And then we're also going to set up authorization. And that's all you got to do. You just uh, add these two lines of code. You don't have to mess around with like authentication schemes. The default authentication scheme will be uh, assumed to be the one, the only one that you've got, and then the necessary middleware will be added for you. All right. Okay. So now we've got authentication set up. We can go to our group. So there's our you know, map group, and we can say I require authorization. All right. So we save this, and now if we rerun, uh, let's see if we. Uh, are now getting uh, what if getting any security for our APIs? Let's try out just sending a post request, and yes, okay. So we're getting a 401 unauthorized. Okay, so now we need to actually you know send a JOT token uh, to this API uh, so that we can uh, continue to test and develop. Uh, that would normally require us to go and uh, set up an identity provider. That can be uh, you know a bit bit onerous. Uh, fortunately, in .NET 7, there's a new uh, dev time tool that lets us generate uh, develop dev time only JOT tokens that we can use with our app to, to test uh, its various features. The tool is called User Jots, and to use it, we can just go to the Visual Studio terminal. It's a command line tool, and let's just run here .NET user jots create. Okay, that's all you got to do. And this will then set up our app so that it will uh, honor jot tokens that are created using this tool only for development purposes. You don't use this in production, and it will give us a, a jot token. We can mess around with the claims for that and all those types of things. But for now, I just want to use this to call my API. Uh, I do have one more problem, which is um, the Swagger UI currently doesn't recognize that these API endpoints are secure. Like it doesn't know that I need to pass a jot token. This is admittedly a little bit of a gap in our open API spec generation story right now in .NET 7. We'll work on making this better, but we can fix this by manually telling Swashbuckle that, hey, these APIs are actually secure. They need a JOT token. So let's go ahead and fix that up above. That will replace this uh, add swagger gen call with just a little bit of config. Let's add this. And I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, but what this is doing is it's setting up a security requirement for all of our, our APIs. That's all it's doing. You can go look at the swashbuckle docs to, to see what this does. Okay, and, But if we refresh now, we should see in the Swagger UI that we now have uh, security enabled. We should get a bunch of padlocks. Yep, so now we got all these padlocks here and up above. Okay, and we can click on authorize. There's a place to provide our JOT token that we generated using the user JOTs tool. We go ahead and authorize. I should show that you know here in config is where we're um, setting up that the user JOTs JOT tokens should be honored during development. This is just an app settings.development.json. All right, and then now we should be able to create our to dos again. So let's try it out. Add auth. Are we done with that? Come execute, and boom, yes. 201 created again, we were able to send a, an authorized request. So this is minimal APIs with uh, ASP.NET ASP Core and .NET 7. Super simple, but also super powerful. All right, let's go back to the presentation. Now, we've also made a bunch of improvements in .NET 7 uh, for building web UI with ASP.NET Core and Blazor. 
With Blazor, you can build your web UI completely in C Sharp using reusable components. These components can then be shared across your web apps, uh, mobile applications, and desktop applications. You can host your components on the server using Blazor Server. You can host them on WebAssembly in a browser, or you can host them in a native client app using a hybrid approach, using the Blazor hybrid su uh, support that is integrated with .NET 7. Now, if you also already have a bunch of JavaScript code, like you've been developing with uh, JavaScript-based applications, you can use Blazor components there too. With the new uh, Blazor custom elements support in .NET 7, you can add Blazor components to existing JavaScript-based apps. Let me show you how flexible Blazor components are in uh, ASP.NET Core in .NET 7. Okay, in the keynote earlier today, you probably saw the uh, .NET Podcast app, and they mostly focused on the, the back end there. Let me find it right here. The .NET Podcast app is an a app completely implemented in .NET that lets you um, uh, listen to .NET-related uh, podcasts. Um, this is the web app implementation for the .NET Podcast that calls those minimal APIs that we saw previously. And the web app is implemented using ASMIT Core and Blazor. This uh, client project is our Blazor WebAssembly app. And if we look in its dependencies, we can see that it's using this podcast pages project, which has all of the components that the app needs. Those are down here in this pages folder. So there's all of our Razor components for our Blazor application. Now, if we run the uh, .NET Podcast app, let's bring that up. I've got it running locally on my, my machine. All right, so this is the application. The home page is a Razor page. It's being rendered from the server. But if we go to the podcast player, this is all Blair, Blazor. It's rich, interactive UI. We can like search for podcasts and click on them and flag them to listen later and all that good stuff. You know, a rich, interactive user interface. Now we can now take these Blazor components and reuse them also for native client development with .NET MAUI and Blazor hybrid support. If we go back to the, the solution, up above, we also have a MAUI project. And it's also referencing, if we look in its dependencies, it's also referencing that same uh, pod, uh, podcast pages project with all the Blazor components. And then in MAUI page.xaml, we can see that it's using a Blazor web view to embed those components directly in a native client app, both mobile and desktop. We've got that running here as well. Here's the .NET MAUI app running on Windows. There's a Windows desktop version of the app. It's got all the same functionality. You can click on podcasts and click on podcasts and see them. We can subscribe and so forth. We can see that this is actually um, Blazor-based web UI because if we bring up the browser dev tools and hover over it, we can see all the HTML showing up in the uh, browser dev tools. We can do mobile as well. Here's the uh, mobile version of the .NET Podcast app running natively on Android. So with one set of Blazor web UI components, we've got web, mobile, and desktop. That's pretty awesome. Now, in addition to, to these three app scenarios, you can also take your Blazor components and host them in a JavaScript-based application using the new Blazor custom element support in .NET 7. Let me show you what I mean. So let's go ahead and close .NET Podcast. I'm going to switch over to this other project, uh, Blazor custom elements. Now, this project is uh, a it's an ASP.NET Core server, but it's hosting an Angular client-side app. We can let me go ahead and get this running. The Angular app takes a little while to get up and running. Uh, so if we go look in this client app folder, we can see all the Angular-isms kicking around here. So this is an Angular app. So imagine you have been developing with Angular for a while, and then now you want to start using Blazor. You want to include it uh, into, uh, you want to use Blazor components, but you can't just throw away your existing JavaScript-based application. Can you use them together? And the answer is yes, as soon as uh, Angular comes up. There it is. OK, so here's the Angular app. It's got a few different tabs, home, counter, fetch data. On the counter page, we have an Angular-based counter. You click the counter, it goes up, and we've got this table. What I want to do is I want to replace this Angular counter with a .NET C-sharp-based Blazor component. All right, so how can we do that? Well, I've got a Blazor component defined already in the ASMIT core project. Here it is, all C-sharp and HTML. And then I have registered this component as a custom element, like a standard HTML custom element, uh, just like any other tag. You normally would implement these with JavaScript, but here we're implementing it with, with Blazor, and I'm registering this particular HTML tag name. Okay, So now we can use this from our JavaScript app, just like we would any other HTML tag. Let me just go into the source for the app, find the counter page. First, let's get rid of that, uh, that Angular counter. Don't need that anymore. We'll just uh, uh, save that, and it should uh, 
just disappear, poof, okay. And now let's add a blazer counter right here. We'll go ahead and save that. It's just a normal HTML tag. And now we've got a blazer counter running in our Angular application. You can add blazer components to JavaScript-based apps too. Super cool. Now we want to make sure that every ASP.NET ASP developer can take advantage of the many great benefits of ASP.NET Core. Um, so we've been doing work to make it easier to upgrade your ASP.NET apps to ASP.NET Core. Now, upgrading can be difficult. There's a lot of changes in ASP.NET Core. It really is a completely new web framework built from the, the, the ground up. And if you're still developing your old ASP.NET app, then trying to, to migrate can feel like a race where the finish line just keeps moving ahead. Uh, so what we've done is we've introduced new tooling for Visual Studio that lets you migrate incrementally. You can add an ASP.NET Core project app in front of your old ASP.NET app. And it will then proxy requests using YARP, our reverse proxy, back to the old application. You can then move endpoints one at a time, like controllers and pages to the new application. Uh, and then that new app handles those endpoints. And anything that isn't yet handled yet still falls back to the old app and continues to work. So you can continue to maintain and develop your old app while you're, you're migrating. We're going to have a couple of really great talks tomorrow about upgrading to the latest .NET version that you should definitely check out. Or you can learn more about this tooling at aka.ms slash ASP.NET slash upgrade. Now, there are tons of great new features in ASP.NET Core in .NET 7, way more than we have time to cover in this one session. But that's OK, because right after this session, there's going to be a series of sessions covering all of these great new web features. We have a Blazor talk right after this one with Steve Sanderson, a minimal APIs talk. And then we'll cover all the runtime features. There are talks on Blazor Hybrid later today, and then a lot of great web development talks uh, tomorrow. So be sure to stay tuned in to learn about all the new stuff in ASP.NET Core in .NET 7. And with that, I hope you le enjoyed learning about uh, web development with .NET 7. Um, try it out today. Happy coding. And with that, we'll see if there are any questions. Oh, that was great. I really, every time I hear Dan Roth talk about ASP.NET Core, I just want to go out and program with it and just. I do too. Oh, I just, try ooh, it. I just, I love it so much. So we have this great tag board behind us. Questions? If you want to have them on here, hashtag. .NET Conf, and we'll take it away. So let's see if we have anything. Well, first off, we have tons of watch parties going on right now. And here it here from Omaha.net Omaha. user group. Wow. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Yeah. And I know we have a watch party going on across the street as well today at the reactor oh, right no now way. over here in Redmond. So that's that's super awesome as well. That's so awesome. hello. All right. So what else do we have going on? Just a bunch of new ones. All the exciting. Yeah. Oh, here's one from Eric Winnington. Mm -hmm. I'll step in. Uh, all right. When do we hear about hashtag Yarp? <laughs> sure. So I mean, we we use Yarp. Actually, a lot of those uh, uh, .NET services that we implement at Microsoft, those are actually actively using Yarp. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we built Yarp is because we needed it for our own services. Um, so it's Yarp is available. It's it's absolutely uh, supported. Um, Notice that in the incremental upgrade tooling, we're also using YARP there so that when you want to proxy those requests from the, the fronting ASP.NET Core app to your old ASP.NET app, that's being done using YARP too. So yep, YARP is, uh, is there. It's available. It's an awesome part of the ASP.NET Core ecosystem. Cool. Love it. Yet another reverse proxy. I think that's what it means. Yeah, yeah that's literally what it means. Yet another reverse proxy. 